Hello. In the, today's lecture, we're going to cover a very, very important uh, aspect of the light uh, matter interaction. You know, from the uh, fundamentals that we saw of the light interaction with the atom, we imagine the atom the way we solve the atom using the quantum mechanics, which means a collection of levels that can interact with the electromagnetic uh, field of the radiation. And now we saw that uh, normally the frequency of the field matches the resonance with some level, some collection of two levels. So you have a starting level, and whatever is the level that uh, the transition is allowed, remember we have a so-called matrix element that connect, you know, the light is able to connect the initial and the final state. And then we saw that uh, the one that's close to the, to the frequency of the electromagnetic radiation in terms of energy, which means the energy of the level divided by H bar is expressed in frequency, is equivalent or close by the frequency of the light, that's the one that strongly interacts. So even though we have many, many levels, because they are in different spacing in terms of energy, not all of them couple efficiently to the electromagnetic field. Normally, we end by having what we call the resonance in a couple of levels. So even though we have a multi-level system, in most applications, or in a large number of applications at least, just considering two of those levels is sufficient. And uh, besides that, there are many, many physical systems which can be represented by two levels. You know, an example is the spin of the electron that uh, we did not touch very much, but we're going to do in uh, application of the EPR or NMR. Uh, electromagnetic resonance or uh, nuclear magnetic resonance. The spin can be up and down normally, so we can characterize uh, with a two-level system. When is the spin is, uh, is half? So we're going to deal with that. So that's a real two-level system, the spin of the electron. And, but in many applications, we, we, we can consider two-level, and we can understand a lot of things just using a two-level. So the topic of today is, therefore, a two-level approximation for the light atom interaction. Right? So we're going to consider the system as two important levels that, you know, the system may have many others, but we're going to consider two. One that we're going to call one and the other two. And uh, the electromagnetic field, which we are also going to consider monochromatic, which means a single frequency, is coming, has a spatial dependence, and the amplitude is zero. So, you know, we, we are, we don't have a, a enough letters to express everything. I was going to call the, the amplitude of the, of the light epsilon, but that will confuse with other concepts of epsilon later on. In many applications, we need only two levels. And uh, we're going to consider these two levels now. And uh, for us, the level has energy E1 for level 1, E2 for level 2, right? And uh, those are the, the, the values of the energy. And the E2 minus E1 is, so we can write here already, that uh, E2, E2 minus E1 is what characterizes the level spacing in terms of energy. And if I divide by H bar, that characterizes a typical frequency that I'm going to call omega zero, which is the typical frequency of the energy spacing of the two levels. So we have uh, this physical system, and with this physical system, we are now going to elaborate the interaction of radiation with it. Now, 
before we do that, we have to remember, uh, we, we already told you how is the quantum mechanics of uh, any, any many level system. Here's two. And uh, we, we already explained to you the main concepts involved. And when we have a, a level, we have um, normally the time oscillation, because remember, now the electron in this level, or whatever is the physical system, is a wave and has a time dependence. And the time dependence is always the energy divided by h bar. The oscillation is always the energy divided by h bar. So this is the time dependence, and we have a spatial dependence of this level. So we have a, a wave function that represents the level one, which is with the sub-index one. Energy one. So you have the time dependence, because the system is there. It has a spatial dependence and a time dependence. That's for the level one. And for the level two, equivalently, we have a wave function, which is psi two, and this psi two wave function that represents level two has a time dependent, which is exponential of minus i e two divided by h bar t. So the, the level two oscillates in time, because it is a wave, right? We are in the context of wave mechanics or quantum mechanics. Is uh, the frequency is e two divided by h bar, the Planck constants divided by normalized by two pi, and that is also a spatial dependence. So we have uh, for the two levels two spatial dependence and two time oscillations. And of course, what we need to do here is make sure. Remember when I explained to you that the radiation, what the radiation does, the radiation takes the system, so if you're going to start in one, you know, we can start the system anywhere we want. But if we start the system in level one, normally we can represent by a, what we call a bracket type of uh, 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 notation, this is, the bra is one, the cat is the other, but doesn't matter. We're going from the state to one, of course, as I explained to you, what the radiation is going to do. is going to take the system from one level and promote to the other. This is the transition. That's the electromagnetic effect on the, on the levels, promoting transitions, promoting the system to go from one level of energy, one state to the next. And the electromagnetic radiation now has to be able to act specially on the spatial form. Remember the matrix element. It must be a matrix element between these two levels caused by the electromagnetic radiation able to take the system from one to two. So the spatial, the electromagnetic field has to be able to match and has to be able to transfer energy that will transform the oscillation from E1 divided by H bar to E2 divided by H bar, right? We already saw many effects that happens uh, when the electromagnetic, electromagnetic radiation interacts with the atom. And I explained to you many of those uh, general aspects in, in, um, in the previous lectures. Uh, okay, up to that point, we have kept it, basically, the spatial variation of the radiation as e to the i k r, with k is the wave vector, 2 pi divided by lambda. And now r here is basically the coordinate of the electron, which is the size, more or less, of the atom, which is angstrom. But uh, we are dealing with a radiation that's thousand times more. We are dealing with radiation that's one micron. One micron to one angstrom is a large factor. You know, if you see here converted to meters, we have a, a factor of 10 to the four. So for the electron in the atom, does not really matter the spatial variation of, of the field. 
you know, you have a field with spatial variation is big, is on the order of lambda. And we have an atom that's sitting here somewhere with a dimension of angstrom, 10,000 times less. So what the atom really sees is just a, a time variation. It cannot, you know, for the, exp the spatial dependence or the occupation, spatial occupation of the wave function, which is here represented by phi, you know, the, the atom cannot experience the spatial variation of the field. Well, in many cases it can, in, in larger order, it can because there is a gradient you know, in the field in space and gradient of electro, electrical field make uh, forces on dipoles and things like this. So uh, in, in, in some situations it can, but normally it cannot. In the most, most, con, most uh, traditional interaction, will not. So we go, we're going to expand the spatial variation of the electromagnetic field. The spatial which is exponential of i k r, which we know is a composition of sine and cosine of k r. <coughs> this is only the spatial variation. The time variation, which is omega t, we already going to leave uh, 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 separately. We can say that uh, because of the coordinate we're going to use is much smaller than lambda, k times r is very small. K times R, because this guy is 10 to the minus 10, this guy is on the order of 10 to the to the 6, right? Because it's 1 over lambda, right? So the lambda is 10 to the minus 6, but 1 over lambda is 10 to the 6. We get about 10 to the minus 4 for this term. So this is very small, and we can expand uh, keeping only the first term here. And uh, because this is very small, the first interesting approximation that we can do is consider that the spatial part is not important at all. We're going to consider that the spatial part of the electromagnetic field is not important. So we're going to keep only the first term of the spatial part, which is U, unit 1. Neglecting the spatial part of the field we have a very important approximation in the elect uh, electromagnetic interaction with the atom, which is called the dipole interaction. So basically what's happening is the field is basically constant. Therefore, because it's displacing between one state and the other, that is a displacement of the, of the electronic cloud, it's like a dipole. So if you take the displacement, if you take a matrix element, which is R sandwiched between the initial and the final state, that may not be zero because those states, they are connected through a displacement. And we know that displacement of charge can induce dipole, right? And this is called the dipole approximation. And the dipole approximation is uh, very interesting because um, uh, it's the most important interaction we have. It's the strong interaction we have of the light with the atom and uh, can uh, induce many, many effects. And in fact, uh, most of the things we see which are interacting with the light are interacting uh, via a dipole type of interaction and giving immediately the light to us uh, the way we see. So this is an approximation that's very important, and it's the one that we're going to work now for this uh, two-level interaction of the atom. So just to uh, kind of put it together our mind, we are considering a, a, a physical system which is two-level, interacting with a monochromatic electromagnetic field with amplitude is E0. Those levels, they have a specific wave function because we already discussed. And uh, we want to make sure the light can connect the state one with the state two, or vice versa, right? That is also, sometimes you are in state two, 
you want to come back to state one. So if it connects one, connects the other, because one is the complex conjugate of the other in this contest. And uh, now comes the first approximation. Up to now, we did not do any approximation on the spatial variation of the electromagnetic field. This is the first one. This is the first one we do. And because we did this, you're going to see that the consequences are very interesting. And that matrix element that we spoke in the previous lecture uh, resume itself to be a matrix element like, you know, the, state, the initial state, the final state, the displacement, and the initial state. If this is not zero, means that the dipole transition. And that has a physical interpretation, and we know the physical interpretation is that the state one and two are connected through a displacement. So if you make a displacement of the electronic cloud, means that you are somehow inducing a dipole during the interaction of the lead magnetic field with the radiation. So that's the approximation we're going to use. And uh, uh, let's split this approximation. This approximation can be represented by what we call a dipole and the field. But uh, here the field is the field of the electromagnetic radiation that we already told you that's only time independence. So basically, beside the time independence here, which is, is going to come out from the calculation, we have uh, only the dipole. Now, what is this dipole? This dipole is an interaction, and normally the dipole is the charge of the electron. This, this dipole is called dipole transition. And this dipole will be basically the charge of the electron times a displacement. This is what it is. Of course, this is vector, this is vector. That's all. Right? And the electromagnetic field is a vector. So there will be a cross product here. That uh, if we, I try to displace the, the, the atomic cloud perpendicular to the field, those levels do not couple to the electromagnetic field. It gives zero. Because it's not a dipole induced type of interaction. Right? So this is traditional dipole that we learn. And. Uh, you know, I'm going to simplify a lot the calculations here, so you be careful. I'm going to explain to you. We're going to reach a very important result considering the two-level system, but I'm not going to give everything in detail. Otherwise, we will have a, 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 a very, very uh, large sequence of lecture to explain. But the two-level system is so important in physics that we could teach a course on two-level system. This is a very important uh, uh, type of physical system. And uh, as I told you, we could teach a course on this because it's, it's very important and has tremendous applications in many things. So we have here the dipole approximation. And uh, we're going to call this, oh, oh, by the way, the dipole is the charge times the displacement. Then we're going to call um, interaction energy. Normally, we, we call the energy by Hamiltonian. This is the normal uh, language of, uh, of uh, quantum mechanics. But this is an energy that represents the interaction. And uh, it is the product. And you know we're going to say that they are parallel. Uh, the, the dipole that you're going to use is parallel, and therefore, the connection between the two levels will be given by this. And uh, the interaction term is therefore the dipole, which is basically a displacement times the charge of the electron, times the amplitude of the field and the time variation. Because now I have to keep the time variation here. Right? So the spatial part will be here in this interaction. And that's going to generate the matrix element for this. So the matrix element, which is uh, the sandwich or the integral between the initial, the interaction, and the final state, is, is, is now this term here. That we're going to call aga int, 
or the Hamiltonian of interaction, or just the energy of interaction, if you will. So this is the important part, because this is be the interaction now that we're going to consider in your level approximation and to solve the problem. Well, when the system is there, quiet, the two-level system has also is also represented by an energy, which is the Hamiltonian, as I told you. And of course, this Hamiltonian times the wave function give you the Schrodinger equation. And uh, this system is represented by a Hamiltonian that's given by minus h bar squared divided by 2m. The Laplacian, which is the momentum square, remember all the previous lecture, plus whatever is uh, uh, the potential that's keeping, that's producing this two level system, right? This potential is there, could be a box, could be something, I don't know, anything you want, but it's there. It's there, and it's all in this H0, which is the energy of the system when there is no interaction. So this is no interaction, no interaction. When there is no interaction, the system is represented by this, and as I told you, considering the wave equation for this system. So when we come here and take the wave equation, remember we learned about the wave equation, energy, which is the time variation, right? Is equal, applied to the psi, to the wave function, is equal to the energy times the wave function. And this energy is a mathematical operation, so this is a notation for you to recover the main equation that we already learned. And for the non-interacting, the system that's there quiet, the two-level that's there quiet, this system here has two functions as solutions. That's why we call two-level. Oh, but you said that maybe the two level is an approximation of me. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's what I said. This is the two main solutions that we have to consider. But there are many real two level systems in nature, as we're going to see a few examples. So this is this is everything the system is. When the system is there, no interaction with light, the solution of the wave equation is just this, this two state, psi 1, psi 2, which has the time dependence and the spatial dependence, as I told you. This is the whole universe. That's everything the system can be. This system cannot be anything else. Can be one state, can be the other. That's the solution of this equation. Therefore, the sum of them, the superposition of them, can also be a solution. That's the main part of the, the things we're going to do. This is the whole universe for the two-level system. Nothing else can be in the system besides being in one state or the other or the superposition of them. Superposition of states is very, very important because, you know, if you want to understand a little bit about uh, uh, quantum computer, things like this, you're going to have a, this concept of superposition, you know. You have a system that has this solution, this interaction may always produce a superposition of those solutions. Now, we have this. This is the whole universe for the system. And uh, what's going to do now? We're going to turn on the interaction. So we put the interaction on. Now we let the interaction take place. That's a crucial moment here. Because uh, as the interaction takes place, as the interaction takes place, the equation that we just saw adds the interaction on it. So now the energy of the system is not only the energy that the system had before interaction, but it's the energy of the system plus the energy of the interaction. And the equation is modified. This equation here will be I h bar d dt 
of psi, which is the same term, is equal to the initial interaction plus the interaction of the system that's produced by the electromagnetic radiation. Then now we're going to consider a dipole. And this applied in the psi. Just to not confuse anybody, right? Let me just make a change. I'm going to call this psi zero. And then actually here, I have a one or two S solution. And when I turn on the interaction, the way I told you, because this is essentially a time independent uh, interaction caused by the electromagnetic field, we're going to have a S solution. Just pay attention very much to this part. What is going to happen is the solution of this equation with the interaction is basically a superposition of the two solutions. So what the radiation does is shake the system in a way that can make the system appear like state one or state two. Even though you can, you may start somewhere when you turn on the radiation, either one or two, because the system was there. It could be in any state. Both states are equally probable, or they are allowed to be. That was the system without interaction. Then we turn on the interaction. What does this interaction make? Start to modify the spatial distribution of charge, and that is going to happen if there is a matrix element connecting state to one and state two, as I told you before, all the relations are there. And the new solution is a superposition of the two possible states. So basically, this two possible state is everything that the system can be. And the electromagnetic radiation just make it be in any of those, and probabilistically speaking, which is the new wave function solution, is a sum of those. In the absence of the, of the radiation, probably the coefficients that we have should be fixed. It's possible to leave the system in a superposition of, of uh, states without having radiation? Yes, if there was radiation previously, the radiation, act for a period, produce the superposition. If that is not in destroying the superposition, they're going to stay. It's a superposition that can stay forever. Normally there are facts, as we're going to see, that destroy this causing decay, causing dissipation on the system. And then the system will try to be in the state of low energy. But this is important because this is the universe of the system. This is everything the system can be. What the radiation is going to do is produce a superposition of states. Superposition of the two state is the solution. But it's not any superposition. It's a superposition. I know the solution. I know Psi 1 and I know Psi 2. They are the solutions of the system without the interaction. Right? I put zero here just to tell you that uh, this was the two solutions. But now what this time variation of the interaction does is produce the superposition of the two states. And uh, the special time variation here will make special values for the two coefficients or the two amplitude of the superposition. I know this one, I know Psi 1 and Psi 2, because as I told you, I know the solution uh, with the system without interaction. Now the big problem is determine A1 and A2 as the time goes. What are the two coefficients as the time goes? Because uh, looking to this, as I told you, when I multiply this by that, I'm going to have because the Psi 1 and Psi 2 are orthonormal, you know, they are Psi 1, Psi 1 is 1, Psi 2, Psi 2 is 1, Psi 1, Psi 2 is 0, and Psi 2, Psi 1 is 0. 
So when I make the when I make the, the psi psi, I get exactly a1 modulus square plus a2 modulus square, which means a1 square is the probability of the system to be in state one. A2 square is the probability of the system to be in state two. Right? I'm going to elaborate a little more on this as uh, as the, the time allow us here. But this is important. You have to understand uh, this fact because, uh, you know, I prepare you to understand that, quantically speaking, when uh, you have the system that uh, can be in any of those states, the radiation will make it a superposition. There are other types of interaction that also going to make superposition of those states. Right? This is a, a, a main fact in this whole business here of the two-level system for you to understand. And uh, once uh, the, the interaction produces a superposition, you may, as I told you, you may start the system in one or the other, but what the superposition does is change the probability for the system to be in one of those states. So this superposition business is fundamental, right? You know, the interaction makes the system to be in a superposition. And if it is in a superposition of states, it is in a superposition. You know, the probability to find the system in each of those states are changing. And that's what the interaction with the electromagnetic field does, changing the probability of finding the system in one or the other state. So there is a chance to change the state of the system interacting with the radiation. That's the conclusion here. And this is what's happened, and we call this transition caused by the electromagnetic radiation, right? And uh, the, the important uh, statement, we could say that being in one of the two state is the whole set of probabilities. You have to understand. That's why I emphasize a lot that the universe of the system is only those two levels. It can only be one and the, one in the other. So when you have the spin of the electron, half, it can be up and down. It can be anything else? No. It can be up and down. It can be in a superposition of probability. You don't know. You measure, you're going to be either up or down. And depends if you put an oscillatory field, as we're going to see, which is related to uh, magnetic resonance type of, of things. Then it can change the probability to be one and the other. And this is what we're doing here. The system can be only in this, in either of those one and two states. And the, the electromagnetic radiation promote a superposition. So it's changing with time the probability of the system to be in one in the other. And this is very, very important. We're going to see many, many things that happen because of this, including the laser effect. The laser effect will be like when I put in two and I make the system comes to one, and adding things to the field and everything, as I already explained to you a little bit when we deal with the uh, stimulated emission of the electromagnetic. Okay, the whole problem now, because I knew the system before the interaction, so I, I know Psi 1 and Psi 2, the whole problem is to determine the coefficients. So ha that's the whole problem we have to solve. So what are the values of A1 depending on time and A2 depending on time? And the interpretation of this is that A1 is the probability to be in state 1. And who, what's the, 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 the 2? Well, the 2 is the probability to stay, to go to state 2, to, to be in state 2. And that's oscillating time, that do all kinds of interesting things. It can only be in one or two, which give us a very important relation. It can only be in one and two. And uh, if uh, 
a1 square is the probability of being 1 and a2 square is the probability of being 2, what is the sum of 1 plus 2 is equal to 1? Because the system can only be in 1 or 2. So this is a very important condition. a1 square plus a2 square modulus is 1. Because that's the conservation of probability. The system is either here or there. Cannot be in any other place. And now we need to solve this equation. We need to produce the solution for this equation. Well, how are we going to do that? Easy, right? We, we know that this is the solution. We know that this is the equation. We know how things will behave for phi, psi 1 and psi 2. You know, if we take uh, H0 acting in psi 1, what are we going to get? E1, the energy of the state, 1. And if uh, H0 acts on psi 2, what's going to give us? E2, because that's the original equation. But because uh, the interaction has a time dependence, we have to keep the explicit time dependence on the levels, which is given by this guy too. So we can uh, apply this solution to the equation, and we're going to find a collection plus a few conditions like a1 squared plus a2 squared is equal to 1. And we're going to have to choose where the system starts if we want to to be more precise. And uh, with some other conditions, we can solve the problem and get what is A1 and what is A2. With quant quantically speaking, is the probability of state 1 and 2. Sometimes I repeat a lot to just making sure you are keeping that in mind. Before we doing this to determine A1 and A2, we must uh, remember you about uh, a few conditions that uh, takes place between states. Because uh, f we already took the, 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 the time independence and they are there, we, 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 we're very happy with that. Now, the spatial part of the two state, phi 1 and phi 2, they are, when you do the integral of phi 1, phi 2, Phi 1, Phi 1, complex conjugate, which is basically project Phi 1 in Phi 1, or Phi 2 in Phi 2 is 1, right? Because those functions are what we call orthonormal. Now, Phi 1, Phi 2, or Phi 2, Phi 1 is 0, because they are not connected by nothing. They must have some action on one state to... So this is because they are normalized, and this is because they are orthogonal. And that's uh, intrinsically properties related to solutions of the quantum system. You know, each mode, each of the solution of the wave equation or the master equation is orthogonal each other. That's one way to preserve that the system has to be in one or the other uh, until some external things can come and promote from one to the other. That's what we're doing here uh, with the... Uh, electromagnetic radiation. We, we have to use those properties. We have to input this on, this on the equation. With those properties plus the equation, we solve for uh, A1 and A2. We're going to get a time equation, a time variation equation for A1 and A2. So we're going to get how is the equation for A1 and how is the equation for A2. But remember, they don't depend on space anymore, only in time. So we're going to have an equation that's time independent only, because of those coefficients, they are time independent only. And if we solve this, if we can get A1 and A2, we can understand the, what the radiation is doing for this two-level system. and. Uh, this is an important concept, and uh, this is what we're going to do in the next lecture. But just before we end, 
you have to think a little bit everything I have said in this lecture to understand it the next. We have a two-level system. It doesn't matter if we the system is more complex. We consider it in two. So for any purpose of quantum mechanics, the two level is the two things the system can be. All the others are out. And I told you that our physical system that behavior like a two level. If this is everything the system can be, what the radiation is going to do is making a combination, making the system to migrate from one to the other, and the probability will depend on time. So if I turn on the radiation and wait some time, I start with the system in level one, suddenly after some time, a typical time, a characteristic time, we will be in level two. And if I keep the radiation there, we will return to one and so on. This is what's going to happen. Those are important oscillations of the system and shows a, a coherence between the superposition. The system will oscillate very, very smoothly between one and the other. But suppose I turn on the system, the radiation, the system is in one, and then it evolves to two, and I stop. Then I transfer the system from state one to state two. This is called population transfer. And it's very important for many, many things, because when things can be many possibilities, we may transfer the system from one state to the other by playing with the time we interact with the system. That's the physical picture we are solving. And in the next lecture, I now will solve, get A1 and A2, and explain to you everything that happens. Why this is so interesting? Why that give us the main phenomenon that occurs in nature? And what's the probability, and what makes, what is also that I did not include, that makes the system to, to make the transition and then decay to something else? Everything we're going to discuss in the next lecture. See you in the next lecture. Bye-bye.